Welcome to the 2020 Virtual Sydney Film Festival, the first of the COVID era, and to our discussion regarding the portrayal of women on screen. My name is Deanne Weir. I am the chair of the festival, and it's my particular honour tonight to host a conversation with three of Australia's most dynamic filmmaking talents, Mira Folks, Rita Kalnage, and Leah Purcell. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm participating in this uh, conversation from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, storytellers for over 60,000 years. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now, tonight's panelists are true triple threats, actors, writers, directors, and they also happen to be women. In some ways, maybe we would hope that by 2020, Gender wouldn't be a particularly relevant part of um, most conversations, but given where we are in terms of gender equity across our society and female representation both in front of and behind the camera, gender is still absolutely a relevant part of the narrative. And despite the incredible success of the women who will be speaking this evening, women remain underrepresented within the industry and within our stories. The question of representation is actually particularly important when it comes to screen content, which is the most pervasive cultural product of our time. So as a storytelling community, I really believe we all have a responsibility to ensure that the breadth of our stories are represented in the content that we're absorbing. And this includes stories from the perspective of 51% of the population who happen to be women in all of their incredible diversity and complexity. Now that's why Sydney Film Festival joined with other major film festivals around the world to sign the 5050 by 2020 pledge for gender parity and inclusion in film festivals and to reinforce our commitment to these principles and give us a process by which we could actually measure how well we're doing. SFF has made a really conscious commitment to nurture, um, empower, promote and celebrate women in the screen sector and we're really grateful for the support of a fantastic group of women who came together to support uh, at last year's festival to help us in this whole pursuit. The combined donations of the Sydney Film Festival Women's Giving Collective enable events like this to happen and we'd really like to thank them for their support. And if you would like more information about the collective, please do get in touch with our philanthropy team. But enough about us. Um, let's turn to the discussion at hand and welcome this evening's panellists, Mira, Rita and Leah. Now, Mira Folks is an actor, writer and director whose debut feature, Judy and Punch, was a huge favourite at the 2019 festival and who has a fantastic new project in development that I'm very keen to hear about, Runaway, based on an Alice Munro story. And she has assembled what I would call a female dream team. Mira as writer-director, Liz Watts as producer, and Jane Campion and Jan Chapman as executive producers. Then we have Rita Kalnage, an actor and writer whose award-winning Belvoir play Baby Teeth was transformed by Rita into an exquisite script for the upcoming feature film of the same name. The film is the debut feature for director Shannon Murphy and stars Essie Davis, Ben Mendelsohn, Eliza Scanlon and Toby Wallace and fantastic performances. Following its world premiere and competition at Venice Film Festival last year and having been slightly interrupted by a global pandemic, Baby Teeth will finally premiere on Australian cinema screens on July 23, and you must go and see it. Um, but full disclosure, I will admit I am an investor in the film. Rita currently lives in London, um, having recently co-written Surge, a new British feature film starring Ben Wishaw that premiered at Sundance Film Festival in January. And finally, our third panellist, the multi-award winning Australian icon, Leah Purcell, a theatre, film and television actor, singer, director, playwright and author, whose career has encompassed some of the most iconic Australian stories of the last 30 years, including Box the Pony, Lantana, Love My Way, Redfern Now, Last Cab to Darwin and now Wentworth. Leah's extraordinary reinterpretation of Henry Lawson's The Drover's Wife graced Australian stages and won multiple awards in 2017. She has since turned it into a novel and will soon bring it to the big screen as The Drover's Wife, The Legend of Molly Johnson, written and directed and star by and starring Leah Purcell. So a very exciting um, film to come. So 
Ladies, welcome. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. Um, look, reflecting on that work that I've just reeled off um, that you've all been involved in, there's an incredibly rich tapestry of complex stories. And what also stands out is that there are some amazing female characters within um, that work whether it's 15-year-old Miller in Baby Teeth, whether it's Mia Wisikowska's Judy in, in Judy and Punch, or whether it's, you know, Molly Johnson's character herself in The Drover's Wife. So I wanted to just kick off by talking about how do you, how do all of you approach writing female characters? I mean, do you think that women bring something different to writing females or should a writer just be able to write for anybody? Um, what do you think? Leah, can I can I start with you? Yeah, look, I think a writer should be able, well, men have been writing for women for a very long time. I do think um, writers should be able to write all sorts of characters. Me personally, I'm just on a journey. Someone said to me, write what you know about. So that's black women's stories. Um, it's something that I know. It's something that I've seen in my mother, my grandmother, my aunties, my sisters, my cousins, my friends. So, so that I look good. <laughs> I want to write what I know about and, uh, and, 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 and share in those stories. Um, I think as women, you know, we, we know who we are inside out. But, I, yeah, it, it, it's a tough one. But, you know, I've, I've, I've written men characters and I was really confident in the characters that I brought to screen in, in The Drover's Wife. I was more worried about writing the words for Louisa Clintoff, a white woman from London who I had nothing really in common with. I was more scared about getting her wrong. Um, but I think it's just, it's, it's trial, it's error, it's, it's experience, it's just, and, and making your craft be the best that it can be. Hmm. Rita, what about you? Um, well, I think that, it, you know, anyone can write anything. But, yeah, I think it's about... I think it's about sincere interest in um, understanding that person, understanding where they're coming from, like really inhabiting them as much as you can. And yeah, I mean, I'm really into, I'm really into research and I'm really into kind of mm -hmm. talking with people and kind of learning as much as I possibly can to get inside a character. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I love writing women characters because I love, I love women and I love sort of, I love being inside women of different ages and kind of trying to understand that. And, but I also love writing men characters as well. And, and there's some brilliantly written women characters written by men. Mm. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's really about interest and respect and, um, and sin sincerity, actually. Yeah. And allowing everyone to be everyone to be everything, like not putting limits on people. And as soon as you find that you are putting limits on them, like you could sort of have to check yourself and and work out where your limitations are. Are they limits coming from just unconscious bias or your own views around what you know people particular? genders would do or not do or is it more around the character itself um I think I find it pretty easy to fall in love with my characters like I'm pretty good at falling in love but I think when a character has certain limitations like you can't get beyond a particular point then that's that's your limitation often rather than the characters and you know, I have a lot of therapy while I'm writing as well, so I can kind of just get beyond myself and let characters live it out. Yeah. Um, well, Mira, I definitely fell in love with Judy. Um, I, I thought she was such a fantastic character. What, tell us a bit about your approach. Oh, that's good. Yeah, look, I, I think uh, I agree with Leah and Rita. I mean, I definitely think that interest and curiosity is key and you can develop that with any character that you're approaching, but you have to be curious and, uh, and interested in, in that world. But, but um, I think what Leah said about just writing from what you know really hits the nail on the head because I don't ever think about 
complexity or difficulty being around gender. Um, it's much more difficult for me to write characters that are way outside my kind of realm. Um, so, you know, what Leah said about having to write a, a, about an English, a white woman in England is, is, is difficult. I completely understand that when I'm having to sort of step really hugely outside my socio -demo socioeconomic demographic or, or cultural demographic, then that becomes a little frightening. Um, but I've never felt it um, on a gender line particularly. I mean, I think, you know, it's always easier when you know it intimately and we are women and we know what that feels like intimately, but we know what that feels like from a very particular, you know, I know it from a middle-class white woman born in Queensland going to these schools, you know, whatever that is. So there's certain things that come really easily for me. Certainly, um, you know, I didn't have any sense of what it might be be for a for a puppeteer in the mid 17th century so that feels like a stretch but humans don't change that much right so I also kind of rely on that sort of um uh on that theory that people's instincts and um you know behavioral patterns I I, I think I hope and sometimes it saddens me to realize never really changed that much so I mean I found uh, Judy was a joy to write but as was Punch I found them equally as as fun but um yeah it's not it's not often that gender feels like the uh, obstacle for me it's more often that it's other um that it's other things that feel difficult just because I don't know it yeah they're both such amazing characters Mira oh thanks Reeds <laughs> thank you such, such a pleasure to watch yeah. I mean, what's actually interesting using that as an example is sometimes, and I remember this from when I was at drama school and we are doing like restoration theatre and I'm sure you guys are all kind of familiar with those plays and there's like, I remember being cast in like the kind of, uh, I was sort of the, the romance, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher this and all the kind of um, really, um, um, it, the theatre people are going to, know that I'm butchering it anyway but the, but I was cast as like the, the straight romantic leads and then around the periphery there was always these really fun wild awesome characters that as an actor you always wanted to play rather than sort of straight romantic and with Judy and Punch it was interesting because I realized that Mia's character Judy was very much the kind of bedrock and the the one sort of sane sensible reasonable sort of straight-headed person in that world and it, so it was actually a lot more fun writing for Punch but what was hard it was actually more challenging writing for Judy because I had to find um a voice for her that was playful and that was that was um you know um bold and weird and sometimes flawed and I really wanted to try and find that for her and so in a way it was actually much harder writing writing Judy's role than it was Punch's. I'm interested Oh, sorry. No, no, go, 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 read it. Go, go, go. I just, I just love it when she's sort of, when her violence is kicking in and you see sort of all the different expressions of her violence running through it. I just think it's stunning. I had someone um, involved in the sort of development say to me really early on in an early draft, they were like, oh, you just got to write her like a man, like just write her like a man. And I, I, at the time I was really offended and I was really pissed off at that, at that note. And I was like, fuck him. I was like, oh, stuff you, I'm not going to write her as a man. She's a woman. I'm going to write her as a woman and I'm going to give her her particular form of vengeance. And I think it's smarter than that. And it's, blah, blah, blah. but I completely understand this sentiment because they were kind of yearning for a character that had the power, that had that male power, but they didn't articulate it quite uh, in the right way. But um, uh, anyway, sorry. I but I mean, that, that's interesting, right? Because we don't, uh, traditionally, we haven't often identified female characters with, violent elements or whatever but I mean Leah in in the drover's wife with you know and Molly Molly's in a very violent world um uh how did you how did you approach the the sort of the 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 I guess the inherent threat in that environment and her need to um protect herself and her family what what mm. how did you think about writing violence in the context of her character well, I guess I guess when you've experienced it yourself, <laughs> it kind of, you know, it, it's it's semi autobiographical of what I went through, and then you take it to another level uh, in regards to you know the the drama of the piece that you need. But um, you know, someone said to me too, Mira, that um, you know nothing happens until the men <laughs> roll up. So I went back and went, oh, okay, I'll give you something to happen. Mm. Um, so it's notes like that that I put up on the wall, and it drives me, you know. Mm. But 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 for me, um, 
unfortunately, I grew up around violence in the community. I was brought up with, I personally experienced domestic violence. So a lot of that comes from a place of knowing and experiencing and seeing my friends go through it and knowing that. So I could actually write from a personal place. And then, you know, I remember when, when you first start out, someone said, just put your characters through so much hell, um, you know, and they are the triumph or it's a tragedy at the end. So, you know, when you're just trying to hit your dramatic beats and plot points, you, you, you just turn up the Bunsen burner. But for me personally, a lot of that came from a personal knowing and being in that situation and unfortunately we see it regularly on our news that women are still dealing with domestic violence and you know the only outcome is Molly does have a little bit I don't like to call it revenge she's at her last she's at her very not weakest she's just so exhausted and her action is because of that but you know that's that was a statement that women are still dying from domestic violence in 2020. And I guess that's the, you know, we, we've had so many women represented as the, the victims of violence, but, but I think the, for giving women far more agency um, is something that's probably more, uh, more recent, the la- you know, the last 10 or, or so years. Um, do you think some of that trying to actually drive w- female characters as having much more agency, is that being driven by female writers? Uh- I think well, definitely in my in in my case, um, that was one of my motivations. But I don't know how comfortable I would have been if I would have put what Molly does in 2020. You know, do you fight violence with violence? You know, in 1893, you can kind of get away with with that. So you know, it would be a. I don't know what the story would have been if I did place it in 2020. Yeah, yeah I felt exactly the same way with my film. Actually, it was like I couldn't write these characters doing these things now and that's interesting you have a certain liberty if you uh yeah I think it's really fascinating how ingrained these like um like classic story narratives are in you so that even as a woman you can fall into these patterns of writing in a certain you don't even question it until someone perhaps points it out to you or until you step back from it you go oh I'm just doing this because this is what I'm used to so you're not actually necessarily serving your female characters in the best possible way. And so I think that's sort of interesting. I'm interested, I guess, all of you, you're all actors um, as well as, as writers. How, how does being an act, as you write, how does being an actor inform sometimes the approach that you're taking to script? Um, are, you, are you very conscious as you write of, you know, some of the, the the things that you haven't liked as an actor that you've that you've seen and you wish that a script had given you? Are you trying to sort of um, deal with that? Um, I don't act anymore. I um, just don't want to, so I don't do it. Um, but I um, I think that it's such great training to be an actor. Like you really learn to sit very fully and very physically in whatever scene you're writing in. And so you can kind of like, rather than your characters necessarily behaving in a kind of logical way, you behave in a bodily way, which is like, I mean, it can look, it can, it can look completely kind of nuts from the outside, but it's like, it's how we act because we're animals. But Um, I think I have heard that um, actors are better at character and dialogue and worse at plot. And, I mean, I know that's a generalisation, but it's so true for me. Like, so true for me too. So true for me. I get so excited about dialogue, the colouring in, but I'm so bad (laughs) at structure. I know. I know. It's a nightmare talking up. It's such similar things because, and it goes back to that thing about curiosity, you know. Like I think the the, the greatest, um, the most important thing for you as an actor is to develop an acute sort of curiosity of, of uh, an interest in people. And I remember, I remember doing this exercise back in drama school. We had to, it was like a Mike Lee sort of type exercise where we had to take a character that we'd worked up into the public and do that. And it's like it, it, my brain just exploded because I remember looking around me and going, "Oh my god, every single person is." So so interesting and whether or not I managed to kind of find that detail in my acting work I'm I don't know but I certainly think that that's 
so important uh, as a writer um, that that that's a really beneficial uh, thing to have. I mean, Leah, on um, this new film, you've been director, actor, writer. Um, how on earth did, how do you juggle all of that? And I mean, you, you, you know, Mira, you're writing and directing on um, your new film, and which you, you did obviously on, on Judy and Punch as well. How, how do you deal with the complexity of that? Do you think it helps to direct, direct what you've written? Leah, do you? Do you... I, I, I like it because I know it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I better get it right, um, but I, I, I do like that. I think I think to uh, write a director is kind of the ultimate when you can take something from an embryonic stage and watch it grow on the page, and then you try to colour it in with your composition of shots and bringing actors in to um, you know to say your words. I, I find that quite exciting. Um, then you know I've been writing my stuff since '97 so that I could have a lead role in something. Um, you know, I was quite an activist as being an Aboriginal woman, but I've this fair skin and no one knew sort of where to put me. So I said I'll put myself in a lead role. Um, and as selfish as that sounds, but it, it, it allowed me to showcase my talents. It allowed me to be seen. It's gotten to me where I am today, where I had trust from Screen Australia, Create New South Wales and investors that I could do the three jobs. And it's just being so well prepared. like, And then having written a play, you know, I've been I've been so wrapped in Molly Johnson um, since 2000 and oh well 2006 really when I shouted out on top of Mount Kosciuszko I'm coming back here to do a film and I'll probably write it be in it and it'll probably be something to do with Drover's wife, but you know taking starting that in a theatre piece having the wonderful support of Bell Naves Foundation where I could sit down and write and have dramaturgs around, the understanding of that. And then, of course, whilst I was doing... And then having great actors in the room that are script, their strength is script, and to, to collaborate... You know, they always thought, did you see the changes? I said, of course I saw the changes, but I actually really like them. Thank you. You know, I was never one to go, no, no, my words, my words. You know, I even sat on the chopping block one day and went, Molly Johnson wouldn't say this. And they said, you're going to have to talk to the writer. I said, okay, get her in here. You know, so I even questioned myself at times. I did it on the film. They all thought I was crazy. I said, no, I'm really serious. This is a really bad line. Who wrote this? Um, so I think that's great when you know that the piece is alive and I'm questioning myself in the many hats that I wore. But it was but it was going from the place. 2014 I finished that opened it 2016 then whilst I was going home at night I, I would I was going home to write the film um, I was talking to audiences and how they thought they that third act fourth act should have went in the play because there's only two acts so it was really great to hear their interest which spurred me on to go there's a film in this um, and then from the film uh, came the, the the opportunity for the novel, which I had to do quite quickly because we wanted it out before the thing. But that was just amazing because I went, oh, crikey, I've got to highlight that and I've got to put that in in the film and shit, I can go back and put that in the, in the play or I'd actually go back to the play and flick through and said, these are the lines that stood out for me and meant something. How can I bring that across into, into the, 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 the film? the screenplay and and with the novel and my challenge was to make the three of them it's the same story but different so I love that that I kept my 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 own interest alive and trying to come up with with yes it's the same ending but each one of them has a different different interpretation which was exciting but to be able to act direct write throw my hat in as a producer as well it's just preparation understanding that homework I still haven't got a life I'm almost close to locking everything off uh we did sound the other day I was in the grade this afternoon um so we're very close but it, it, it is about it, it becomes everything and like my head hurts my eyes I need glasses to see through my own glasses because your eyes are that come cross-eyed with Molly Johnson and the rest of the the world doesn't matter but but I know it's going to be the the film that it that it needs to be or it wants to be and I was just along for the ride. Oh well, I can't wait to to actually um, see it. But I mean, Mira, for you as um, your debut feature as well, you had also written the script. Um, was was that the plan all along? 
Oh, well, actually, on this one, I didn't know whether it was because someone else, Vice in the, in the US, had kind of commissioned me to write the script. And I think for them it was the plan all along and maybe they were kind of waiting to see how it sort of felt. I was under the impression that I was writing it for another director. So uh, otherwise I would never would have written anything so ambitious because it, it was really hard to make. I was like, some idiot's going to have to deal with all these ridiculous problems. <laughs> so it was kind of a blessing in a way because I don't, I think I would have been so so much more conservative about what I was putting on the page if I had thought that it was for me. So, you know, that was that was weird. But there is something so wonderful about, like, so much anxiety and fear that comes along with making a film, and I think for everyone, but, you know, I am particularly prone to that kind of... Um, uh, self-doubt and all of that sort of stuff uh, you know I didn't go to film school I was terrified on day one of my shoot I was like everyone knows more than me I don't know what I'm doing this is going to be the I mean, it's going to be so embarrassing and you know because the reality is that every single crew member on that set has been on more sets than you have as a director it's just the way it is so they kind of um, and I felt really scared but um what being a writer director does is I did some I had this really kind of like um oh, moment where I was like, no, I'm, I'm the authority on this thing because I wrote it. So, you know, um, I became very aware of the, um, uh, uh, of how intimate I was with the material and how I, I, I you know, um, so that, that, that was really lovely. I only wish that I could direct myself. I just, I just couldn't do it. And I couldn't do it for the most embarrassing reasons. Like I'd just be really vain, I think. And I'd just be really like, I wish I could, but yeah, I, I, I don't think I could handle it. I'm too insecure about my acting work. Have you tried? No, no. I don't. I know that there's no point even trying. I just couldn't even. I don't. I never look at a monitor when I'm on set as an actor. I can't do that. It really kind of messes with me a bit. So um, I don't know how I'd get around that one. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I, time. Any time. Do, yeah. Give you time. You'll get there. Like I wouldn't have done this 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. 26 years, 28 years now. And I, I, I can get in there and go. That was crap. Let's go again. Um, I, I love all my ugliness in this film. Oh, I think it's you know, amazing, and just, Leah. I just I'd, yeah. I would love to get to that to that point to be able to. I mean, do you have someone on set that that's helping? Being your, do, is there someone specific other than obviously your script supervisor or your first or whoever's there when you're in scenes that you'll get to to help this second pair of eyes, or do you just have a system where you can jump back and forth? I thought, yeah, I just had a system where uh, you know my my DOP. I had twenty years, you know, working relationship with him. Yeah, um, my script supervisor, Lou, and then and then my my partner, who's my producer, Ben Stewart as well when he sort of went again I just yeah go you know and you yeah. sort of I don't know I just because look it, I, it would have been interesting if I hadn't done the play where I had experienced the emotion and where I needed to go and then understanding that I'm doing film so you don't go that far it would have been interesting if I hadn't because it was amazing I didn't learn my lines they would just, they just came back I go what do I got to do here you know because that night after a shot list I'm going I got to go to bed. Yeah. So I was very lucky that on the way out in the mornings, I'd just quickly read. And then I was amazed at the recall, um, you know, some of the new ones, or I'd go off into a monologue and I go, whoops, hang on, that's from the play. But, um, but I, you know, people had asked me, did I want someone else? And I said, no, look, I trust myself. And if I'm going to bugger this up, then it's all me and me alone. And if I do a great job, then that's a bonus, you know. And and but it's trust in trust in your team. Sometimes I'd look at some of the boys that, you know, the electrics and that have a tear in their eye, and I go, yeah, that's enough. Yeah, you know. So or or they come up and go, whoa, that just moved me. And I went, yeah, yeah. If you if that done that, then then we're in the right. Ballpark. You can make a grip cry. That's the greatest. <laughs> yeah. Perfect, perfect. Hey, I, I mean, Rita, I was, I'm interested. Was interested listening to Leah kind of talk about the when she was doing the play. And then, you know, deciding how she decided that she wanted to make it into a film. What was that journey like for you with Baby Teeth? Did you, um, you know, because there was some years between the the play and then when it was turned, it, it kind of the project for a film kicked off. What was that journey like for you? Um, well, there wasn't such a. There, I mean, it was years writing the and the development that process went for years there wasn't really such a break between the play and the um and starting the screenplay when um Jan and Alex and Catherine optioned it but um 
I, but I, you know, I had moved to London in the meantime, so I had kind of, you know, shaken my head around. Um, it, it was a great experience. It was such an amazing experience. I mean, I just, I'm so lucky to have had that experience. It kind of, I'd always imagined the characters outside. I'd had some images of them kind of doing things that, you know, you, could, you couldn't write a scene of, of it for stage without sort of annihilating the, the designer. But um, it, it was a complete pleasure because I learned my craft doing it. And because with all of the steps of development, there were people who, I mean, it was amazing working with Jan Chapman and um, everybody who I was working with, I was learning so much from. And, you know, you learn, you learn about writing, but you also learn from people who've been working in the industry how to sort of, how to have space around you, how, like and Ravel sort of, I learned that from him and how to sort of sit in your instincts and not know for a while in a place where everyone wants a quick answer. And it sort of, it was very, it was, it was just, very, very difficult and very, very um, excellent. <laughs> and very, very long. Had you written other features, Rita? What? Had you written other features before Baby T? No. Oh, I'd sort of like, before I really knew how to write, I'd written something long. But it was, I mean, it would, would never kind of have been made. It was before I was... It was before I was serious about writing and no one has ever seen it. But it was like, I think the experience of finishing something once and the kind of release that you get from that mm. makes, I don't know, it gives you so much confidence to finish anything at any time. Mm. I'd love to, uh, to hear from all of you on, I mean, are there any particular female, Australian female characters who you wish either you'd written that character or you'd actually played that character? I mean, is there someone that you just think, damn, I wish I'd done that? For me, it wasn't not so much, damn, I wish I'd done that, but I was 15 and Bruce Berriford's um, Fringe Dwellers came to Mergen. They filmed it in my hometown. And I didn't, and I was so excited because, you know, my mother's Aboriginal, single mum, youngest of seven, grew up on, you know, pension. And so there wasn't too much of it. When I told people I wanted to act, they went, yeah, right, sure, kid. Um, you know, good luck with that. And I had no idea how I was going to get there. So when the film came to town, I went, this is it. And they wouldn't cast me because I wasn't black enough to be black and I was too brown to be white. And I went, but I'm the best here. What are you doing? So I followed... I followed the film everywhere in that town. I could tell you whatever corner I was standing on when they were filming. And it was kind of like my first 101 wow. to acting and seeing all these black fellas on the screen, which kept my dream alive. Because prior to that, it's my mother would say, you're black, you're a woman, you're going to work in the meat works or you're going to be a nurse like one of your mm -hmm. sisters. You know, good luck with that. And so I'd tell people that I wanted to be a theatre nurse where I kept the theatre and the acting <laughs> with me and just to shut them up about the nurse. So when I saw that it was actually possible that you could, like, I remember Aunty Kath Walker or Daru Nunaka was there, um, Uncle Bob Mazza, like these were legends. When I sort of, after... Prior to that, apart from the ABC, there wasn't a lot of input into the industry, no telephones, no mobile phones. So I was sort of this little girl on my own. And then to see that film and to be a part of it and wish that I was Trilby, um, you know, and, 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 and hope that I could possibly one day get to do something like hers, that sort of motivated me to keep mm -hmm. my dream alive. You know, and it's in, and and I say that to anyone. It's important to keep dreaming, otherwise you're lost. So, that sort of kicked kicked in 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 for me, and and, and um, you know, here I am today. So, and you know, and, and thank you for that because that's a, that's that's the point of why we need to keep talking about female representation on screen and telling lots so many female stories because unless and you can't be what you can't see and we, we have to see ourselves you know represented I mean um Mira was there a, a character for you or a, a something that a, a film that inspired you in that way 
it's a little scary that I can't think of like 20 women, women off the top of my head that I wish I had have played as an actor, but what, what you can't see, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's always, I mean, as an actor, it's so rough when you miss out on those jobs that you just think this one's going to be like, this one's going to change things and this one's going to be good. Or, Oh, I really know how to play this. Like, you know, I remember my first feature audition out of drama school was, um, Nikki Barrett was casting this film called Candy and it was to play Candy. And I just remember thinking, I know I went to the library, um, was in, on the Sunshine Coast, I never read the book before. I got, got the book out, I read the book, it completely floored me because even though I'd been at drama school for three years, I was still a country kid. I hadn't spent lived in the city and I was really just like, oh, my God, this book, this is crazy. I've got to play this role. I knew nothing about that that woman. I just had was kind of obsessed with this idea of playing the role. Not only didn't did I not get it, I went on to not get like hundreds, literally hundreds of, of roles that I would have loved to play. But there's got you, you kind of have to reach some point, I guess, in your career where you where you just allow the fates to, to, to throw you around, and especially as an actor, otherwise you're just holding on so tightly, and then there's nothing but kind of but rage and and um, sadness at the end of it. So for whatever <laughs> reason, my trajectory has been what it is. And like I did an interview this morning because my film's just about to release in the US tomorrow, actually. And um, and this this American journalist was saying to me. So he'd asked me a bit about the origins of the project and he was saying, so this, like, you must just be pinching yourself because this sounds like the easiest first feature that anyone, ever, the easiest road that anyone ever had to get a film up at, da 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 And I was like, oh, yeah, no, I guess you're right because it was weirdly kind of remarkably easy. It wasn't something that I was fighting hard for. It just, it fell into place. As a lot of my directing and writing work has sort of done, it sort of fell into place around me in a way that the universe was kind of going, do this. And meanwhile, meanwhile, I was going, but I don't want to do that. I want to do, I want those roles. I was, I was kind of holding so tightly onto this idea of being an actor that I didn't even really notice how, how relatively swift. I mean, I, I worked really hard and I made shorts and all of that, but really, it's so hard to get a movie up. And so I just had this little moment today when he said that and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, you're really right. And all I can think about is I never got candy or I never got this or I never got that. It's funny what you hold on to and the universe is kind of going, but actually this is this is where you should be. <laughs> you, well, know. you have won awards for your shorts and, uh, you know, you, you, you've done a lot of uh, great work there. But, um, but yeah. Um, Rita, what about you? Any roles that... Uh, or characters that you you wish had been yours? Um, no, no. <laughs> like I, there's lots of things that I see and I'm like, oh my god, amazing. But um, I feel like uh, I don't I don't feel like I sort of want to own them because I mm -hmm. think what makes them good most of the time is that they they're so personal to yep. whoever created them. Um, I remember seeing Angel Baby and being like, oh, the freedom, amazing. Mm. But um, no, no, I, I actually don't think so. I'm inspired by it, like, pretty much like everything, but, or not everything, but lots of things. <laughs> but, um, I, yeah, no, I don't feel like I kind of wish mm. something had come out of me. Um, and do, do you think that we're generally we, we are getting better at creating female characters? That we're that, that what we're seeing now on screen is much more complex and diverse than perhaps what it, I mean. You know, when I I grew up watching Prisoner on television was kind of the first time I was actually seeing a, a more complex set of female characters um, on television. Um, and if I look back at that and compare that to where we are today. I mean, there's some incredible women on, on television and in film, um, but, you know, we've still got work to do, but um, are you all feeling hopeful? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I feel like what we're, what we're, I mean, kind of global chaos aside, what, what, what's happened in the last sort of, what, I guess, two-ish years in terms of our, um, uh, of, of the way that we've, 
recognise gender imbalance in, uh, on screen, and particularly in Australia, I have to say, with Screen Australia's initiatives, the festivals initiatives, I am actually, I, I, I get really frustrated when I hear people go, yeah, but we've still got a long way to go. I'm like, yeah, of course we do, but this is, this is, what has happened in such a short space of time, I think is nothing short of kind of amazing. I feel like I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing work that wouldn't have existed had it not been for this incredible surge in awareness and push for for, for emerging female writers and directors. And I, I feel like it's really tangible already and I think it's a very short time since we've been put kind of um, putting that at the forefront of our minds. So I feel very positive. Great. Leah, how are you? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I feel very positive. Yeah, I feel very, very positive. And I'm very, I, I guess I'm one of the lucky ones or fortunate ones that coming through the Indigenous, um, what, do you, what would you call it, the Indigenous bubble in the industry when you've had Sally Riley and Erica Glenn at the helm of Screen Australian Indigenous Department, the, the issue of women was very um, ingrained in us and, 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 and they were at the forefront of a lot of our storytelling, you know, through, especially, you know, Redfern now that really mm. brought, you know, the mark up, but in the little shorts and the initiatives that we did, there was a lot of women stories that were being pushed through, you know, and whether that's to do with the strength of our actors or what, but I, I, I feel like when a lot of people say that to me, I said, well, from where, from my journey, of coming through, I've been blessed to have that influence of strong women in those roles, pushing for our stories and pushing us to the forefront. So, and we can only continue, you know, to to do that. It's up to us. It's up to women in higher positions to make sure we are employing the women. We make sure that our women are, are skilled, and and we just continue to, you know, dominate and control and do what we do best. Multitask. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Fantastic. It, it takes a long time to nurture it, to, to, to develop a career, though. I mean, all three of us have been doing it for a hell of a long time in one way or another. So yeah. I, I'm really exciting, excited about what the next five or ten years are going to bring for all of those filmmakers and writers and actors whose names I haven't even, I don't even know yet, but mm. that are just building, that are built, laying the groundwork, you know, right now. Yeah. It's really yeah, absolutely. That's what someone said. You know, why did it take so long for the Indigenous Department to get, you know, Redfern now up, you know, when we've that been around for 20 years? And I said, that's how long it takes. Yeah. And it came and it was brilliant. So if that's what it needs, we can't rush things, can't have sensations overnight. So I can't wait for the next 20 years. Like all these young people that are coming through now through, especially the writers that had the opportunity on black comedy, so excited, yeah. their intellect, it's another level and it's just so exciting. So I'm looking forward to the next 20, 40. Bring it on. Yeah. Um, Rita, being in London, are you seeing anything um, sort of, how are you perhaps looking back at the Australian market? What are you kind of, what are your reflections on that and what are you seeing in London? Um, I think... Well, I'm working on some American things at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think everywhere is demanding a lot more of us. It's demanding a lot more of the characters, a lot more of the social awareness and the sort of being in the world, being in today's world, being in the world now. Mm -hmm. There's lots of talk about what's next, like we don't know what's next. And we, like, it's an amazing, it's an amazing time to be creating in yeah. this when things are so hot and unknown. Um, I think what I felt when I first came here was that um, there's a lot more ease with um, darker stories, like um, sitting in sort of more difficult territory is more acceptable and almost um, people want to do that more over here than in Australia. I feel like there's a tendency towards buoyancy, which is, you know, those two things married is incredibly powerful. And um, I don't know, I think, I think all the industries are evolving super fast. Mm. It's really exciting. Well, I mean, we may live in uncertain times, um, but 
with the talent and the caliber of, of the three of you um, and so many other people working in the industry, I'm, I'm, despite those difficulties, I'm very excited about where we're going. Um, you've been so generous with your, your time and your thoughts um, this evening. And I really want to thank you um, for that. Um, and uh, I can't wait to see um, all of your new projects. Um, maybe can you each give us like, you know, one minute on the, the most the exciting thing that you're working on right now that we are hopefully going to be seeing on screen um, next next year. And, and obviously it's going to be Molly Molly's story, um, driver's wife for you, Leah. Um, when, when do you think we might see it? Well, of course, you know, the COVID-19 is dictating when cinemas and all that opened up. But I, re I think mid-2021, uh, we want to find a nice little laneway between things and bring her out and she'll be raring to go. So I'm excited. Fantastic, fantastic. And Sarah. So I yeah. can't wait to see it. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm dipping my toe into a bit of television at the moment um, and um, I also have um, um, a couple of features I'm developing. I don't know. I mean, it's so everything feels so weirdly hypothetical. I had planned to be in the States for most of this year um, with David, my boyfriend, but actually we're really grateful for this opportunity to be working at home and um, hopefully it means that maybe I'll make some more stuff here um, soon, I, 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 I hope. I mean, I'm very, um, uh, I think we're really lucky about where we're at just at the moment in Australia in terms of how coming back into production is looking likely, maybe in the not too distant future. So I, I hope that I can kind of capitalise that on that and make some, something here. Fantastic. And um, Rita, are we going to see um, uh, your, your film uh, the Ben Wishaw film soon, do you think? Or in, in, or is there something else new that you want to tell us about? Um, well, oh, well, Baby Teeth, obviously, um, directed by amazing Shannon Murphy, um, is coming out very soon, um, which, as you mentioned, but I just realised I hadn't mentioned Shannon and she's like powerhouse, amazing. Um, I... I'm not sure when Surge will be coming out. I, I don't know what's happening with the release of that. Um, it's, I think that um, they're waiting for cinema release, so things are going to be, you know, take the time they take. Um, I'm doing some various TV things in the UK and the US and um, some films and... I don't know, things that, things that I can't even say how long, like when things are going to come or when they're going to be. That's a weird time to answer that question. Yeah. Is that, I mean, it's weird enough in yeah. general, but at the moment it's just like, uh, so, <laughs> right, we, do, we have a definite date for Baby Teeth, uh, July 23, uh, going back into cinemas. So um, uh, it's, it's a beautiful film. So um, It's so beautiful. Everyone should go and yeah. see it. It's so Everyone beautiful. See it. All right. Well, thank you so much for um, your time. Really appreciate it. And um, I hope you have a chance to have a look at some of the Sydney, the virtual Sydney Film Festival, have a look at some of the films that are on offer. And uh, I'm sure everyone's looking forward to seeing all of your next works. But thanks very much for uh, joining us for this discussion. Cheers. Thank you thank so you. much. It's really nice to be here.